All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our session uh, on the privileged poor, revamping a professional learning community to shine a light on systemic barriers in teaching and learning. Um, I'm Pat Mayer, uh, the Dean of Teaching from Nipissing University, and my partner in crime here, my, my co-presenter, Heather Carroll, is the Senior Instructional Designer, and we're both in the Nipissing University Teaching Hub. So before we begin, um, you know, as with most presentations, we do think it's uh, critically important that we acknowledge the land on which we, we live and which we on which we learn. So we would like to acknowledge that Nipissing University, where we're joining from today, is on the territory of the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. The land on which we live and learn is the traditional territory of the Nipissing First Nation and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe. And sort of in these strange times that we find ourselves in, we're, we're all joining each other here on Zoom. And so we acknowledge that with Zoom, we're joining from a number of varied lands. And we respect and are grateful to be part of TESS on many lands with all of our relations. Just to give you a bit of a, a history of professional learning communities at Nipissing University, um, really, these PLCs started uh, out of the, the pandemic, and, and they started it as a way for us to bring together individuals around a common topic. And so they have come together around books, um, and, they, and we started in fall 2020. And as you can see, the five books prior to The Privileged Poor sort of followed a certain trajectory. We had the sort of requisite online teaching books, so small teaching online, and advancing online teaching. In the middle there, we felt that it was important that we talk about bigger picture items. So we talked about radical hope and, and the notion of a teaching manifesto. And this, uh, this summer, we talked about outdoor-based teaching. And so we talked about place-based education and a walking curriculum before we got to um, Anthony Jack's The Privileged Poor. To give you a bit of a sense of the, the structure of these PLCs, um, the former PLCs, so the, all of the ones around the five books I just showed you, um, they only had one meeting. So we came, we, we sort of sought, sought an audience. We, we, we asked people if they wanted to be involved in these communities. Um, we sent them the book. I don't know, maybe one of the, uh, the, the key components was a free book, but maybe not. Um, and then at some point after about, a month and a half to two months, we had one conversation about that book. So the five that, that predated the privileged poor, the average number of registrants was about 12. We had 10, we had 15. On one occasion, we had 16, but it was fairly common. And the group size was about 10 to 15 people who actually came to um, the, the discussion. Um, and, they, and they were largely faculty members. Um, the facilitation model that we used there was a solo facilitation model. So I think for most of the first five, it was myself running the, the conversation. And then that changed with the privileged poor. So the privileged poor, over the course of the fall, um, we've had three meetings. Um, the, the, the number of registrants, there was no average in this case, was, was 33 registrants. And because there were so many people uh, who wanted to be involved, we actually split it into two groups, two cohorts. And so each of those has approximately 15 people. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to do was get this conversation out to the entire university community. And so we were, we were quite purposeful around trying to get a balance of faculty members, staff members, and students, and then make sure that they split relatively evenly um, between those two cohorts. Um, however, staff were very interested in this book. And so the number of staff members in comparison to the other two groups um, is not equal. And with this um, facilitation, we also wanted to make sure that we had faculty, staff, and student facilitators as we were trying to expand the group. And here's that wonderful group. Um, so myself on the left, Heather in the middle, and um, NUSU's Vice President of Advocacy, um, Sarah Pekoski schwer was the third facilitator. And so we attend all three meetings for both cohorts, so six meetings in total. And now I'm going to pass it over to Heather, who's going to explain a bit more 
um, about how this particular PLC worked. Yeah, so we really tried to be super intentional with the changes that we made for this PLC, largely based on the content of the text and what kind of discussions we were going to have related to that. So there was the main themes from the text, the privileged poor, that I wanted to just review with the audience, um, not assuming that anyone here has read it, but highly encourage you all to do so. Um, so the first chapter, which was our first meeting that we discussed, was talking about peer-to-peer -peer relations. And this um, text describes the journeys of low-income first-generation students at um, a case study university. It's considered an elite American institution, but it actually does have a lot of similarities to Nipissing in terms of its student composition size, um, the amount of students who live close to campus. So while it's not a case study of Nipissing by any means, there are a lot of um, similarities between our context and the case in the book. So the first chapter talks about peer-to-peer -peer relations, and I've just pulled some really impactful quotes that um, have stuck with us as group members and facilitators. So an example of peer-to-peer -peer relations and how this fosters a sense of exclusion and unwelcomeness at an institution um, is, so when students um, get these social undercurrents of, I don't belong here, whether they see their peers um, driving cars or wearing designer clothes that they themselves cannot access. Uh, the theme of this chapter is that it leads to social exclusion and isolation, which negatively impacts the student experience. So we all looked at this and how um, we can play a role and be mindful of these undercurrents within our own context. Then the second chapter talked a lot about student to professor relations, and this really resonated with our faculty. So um, a big takeaway from that chapter was that uh, for first generation students, especially, uh, they don't necessarily know the hidden curriculum of higher education. And one of those main things being not just um, when an office hour is in a syllabus, but what an office hour is. So this a quote um, that the expectation to be proactive in making connections with faculty often remains unsaid and that professors assume students know how to make use of office hours and are comfortable doing so. So the text um, clearly demonstrates that peers or students from affluent backgrounds who maybe attended a private boarding school or a private high school have more ease communicating with faculty and outlines um, proactive steps that faculty can take to reduce the disparities in the experience between a first generation student um, and a student who has you know friends, family who have pursued higher education before. And then the third and final chapter talks about student to institution and policy relations. This is super heartbreaking and using the case study in the book, we can compare our own institution to the policies that um, led to exclusion of these students in their experience. So one of those policies is um, the decision to close the dining hall over spring break, not necessarily the breaks between um, semesters, but a spring break in particular, because a lot of the more affluent students on campus can and often do leave for that break. But um, as a testimonial in the books illustrated that in relation to the policy of closing the cafeteria over spring break, a student described her own strategy, which was to increase her online dating activity in the lead up to spring break in order to secure dates for the following week, uh, relying on the gendered norm that men would pay for the first date. She knew she could secure a few meals that way. So looking at the unintended consequences of policies that the institution put into place for whatever intention, but what we are measuring their impact and how that affects different students um, in different ways. So when we were thinking about the facilitation of this PLC, um, we intentionally used the term professional learning community because we wanted to create that community with an emphasis on relationship, shared ideas, and a strong culture. And we're already seeing that with our participants that they're all really motivated to do something about these, pro um, these problems that the book is shining a light on. So um, knowing that everyone was coming into this PLC with very different lived experiences, we wanted to create a safe and a brave space for participants. So we decided to start off with co-constructing norms. Um, and this is in contrast to what we did with the other books that were just about like online learning or place-based education. They might not have been as, so, as personal or um, as emotional for the participants. So for those unfamiliar with the term, norms are a collectivist approach where all participants have the opportunity to shape the expectations of the group. And it's more in line with social justice education as opposed to um, terms that are dictated by the facilitators or the professor. 
So I just wanted to share with you the norms that we elected to give to our group members to start off with, knowing that not all of them would be familiar with the concept. And then we decided to take a hybrid approach. So we used as a base for our norms, um, the four agreements for a courageous conversation from Singleton and Linton. Um, and those were to stay engaged, to expect to experience discomfort, to speak your truth, and to expect and accept a lack of closure, especially about these issues of inclusion and exclusion. We know that those um, are very hairy problems and cannot be solved in a simple PLC or else we would have solved them already. So we opened this discussion to our um, participants and then we asked them if these norms worked for them. For the majority of them, they said yes, but we did have a group that wanted to add some of their own. So they really took ownership over that hybrid, hybrid process. And this is a slide pulled from our slide deck from when we facilitate. So we, um, in this cohort, decided to stick with the four agreements for courageous conversation, but then also add in one about confidentiality. So what is said here stays here. And that we learned is super important when folks are talking about their own experience or their own interaction with institution, policy, other actors, et cetera. And then also that you have the right to pass and no pressure to reply. So a lot of folks are coming and they're being active listeners. They're just soaking it all in and they absolutely do not um, have to feel obligated to share their own story, good or bad, about their experience um, at the institution or as an undergrad in general. So I also wanted to share a participant testimonial. This is from a staff member at Nipissing um, that taking part in the Privileged Poor Book Club has allowed me to personally reflect on my time in school and how I wasn't considering the backgrounds of fellow students or how it was affecting their schooling experience. It has allowed me to reflect on my privilege in terms of coming from a modestly affluent family, attending schools that were located in my hometown, and some of the challenges students face when going away to school in a new town. As a staff member, I am now able to appreciate the perspective of students coming to Nipissing for the first time, and I have a greater understanding of how their backgrounds, whether academic or personal, can play a role in their experience here. It allows me to show more understanding and empathy towards students and towards different situations they encounter nowadays, especially in face of this ongoing pandemic. And I really love that last line because I think these types of discussions should be happening at all times, but especially now with COVID exposing deep inequities in our system, um, if not now, when? And even more excitedly, <laughs> um, when we were figuring out research on first generation student success in order to shift the PLC to talk about these types of issues, we actually discovered a dissertation that was written by Nipissing's own um, and just defended at the <laughs> onset of the pandemic, um, basically just echoing and reinforcing our gut reactions that first generation student success needed to be focused on more in teaching and learning spaces. So we're seeing uh, these, you know, research findings also come true in our PLC and the discussions there. So a lot of the discussion about office hours can be seen in this first quote where like implied messages of what a closed office door might signify. So if a student comes to office hours and they're see, seeing a closed door with a professor who might feel entitled to knock, who might um, just shuffle away and miss that opportunity for connection. And then when institutions further uh, increase the knowledge of first generation students and the institutional gaps that they face, we can reduce cultural and class specific gaps for first generation post secondary participants. And we obviously know that the research suggests that this is a good idea for recruitment, retention and graduation, but also there's a moral obligation there as well. And now I will pass it over to you, Pat. Thanks, Heather. And when we looked at this, we just saw a simmering pot of so many things bubbling up, right? There's many many items that are bubbling up at the same time. I mean, obviously there are some important messages uh, in this book um, from renowned university as it's called in the book. Um, and it could be quite easy to sort of write those off. This is an elite institution in, in, the, in the United States. So it's not Canadian specific. And um, you know, where do we place ourselves on that scale of eliteness? But as we've been having these conversations, there's been so much, so many aha moments from participants. Their lived experience is echoing what's shown in this book. And, and it's their lived experience, you know, within the PLC, we have, you know, we have uh, Black individuals, we have Indigenous individuals, we have people of color, we have folks that sort of read the chapter and, and are like, oh, you know what? I, 
I, I do come from a low income background and I never really thought about that before and how my experience might have been the same as someone else's experience. Um, the Krant thesis, Michael Krant's thesis is, is so timely for this conversation. And that research was done at the Grenfell campus of Memorial University. And, and that is an institution where I think there really are some size and locational um, connections with Nipissing. Um, before we even started the, um, the, the PLC, we did recently name a teaching chair in equity, diversity, and in inclusion, which is an important uh, way for Nipissing to take some of these messages into the classroom and into the conversation around the scholarship of teaching and learning. So we're just in the infancy of that teaching chair, which is filled by um, Charles Anionim in our School of Nursing, but we're so excited to see what comes out of that moving forward. And then just yesterday was the signing of the Scarborough Charter um, about anti-Black racism and, and, and what universities need to do um, in, that, uh, in that space. And so it just seems like the perfect time for all of these to be happening. So it's, it's an ex exciting conversation for Nipissing University. And on that note, um, we did want to say thank you Merci, Miigwech, and uh, we're a little bit um, quicker than expected, which gives us more time for questions, which is great. So we would like to uh, open the floor um, if anyone has questions or feedback or really to talk about anything in this, uh, in this sphere. And I think Heather has, there we go. There's all the supporting literature um, if you did want uh, any of the exact references uh, that we showcased in, the, in this presentation. So here we are. Um, if anyone has any questions for Heather and I, um, you're welcome to raise your hand. You're welcome to unmute yourself and uh, shout out your question um, or, you know, turn on your camera, whatever you like. So I see a comment in the chat that there was a recent commentary on the privileged poor in um, inside higher ed. Um, yes, super timely. Um, it was actually midway through our PLC, so it, the book definitely still resonates. It's not an old book, but it's um, definitely still making the rounds, and folks are taking what they need from it in this time. And that's another piece, too, with our PLCs. We've, we've tried to keep them, you know, as very up-to-date books, so new books, 2019, 2020, um, etc., um, but you never know, we may, we may flip back to an oldie but a goodie uh, in the future, because I think we've seen some value in using books as the conversation starter, um, and we'll keep going from there. Oh, there's another question, what will we do differently this time? <laughs> I have some thoughts, do you have some thoughts? You go first, Heather. Okay, I think we could definitely incentivize student participation more, um, but also lean more on student um, success literature. So there's a lot of uh, bright ideas that are coming up off the backs of students and their suggestion in the PLC. And I think that's what makes it so rich. But I also am um, concerned if we take another book club that focuses on the student experience and often highlights um, things that aren't so great, that students will feel like they have to, you know, trot out their negative experiences in order for staff and faculty to learn. So I think there could be a balance going forward um, if folks are interested in like more student experience pieces to balance that off the literature to take the weight off the students' shoulders um, so they don't feel like they have to necessarily lean on their lived experience to participate. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things um, that we are seeing with this particular PLC is, is in the, even the first week, the first meeting that we had with folks was a call to action, was a call that this can't just, we're gonna have a wonderful conversation and it's gonna fall over. I think there's a real um, passion within the group to see, and, and Heather and Sarah and I have already promised this to, you know, we're gonna take some of the conversations and, and sort of poke at the areas where we can make changes at Nipissing, which I think ties in, to the question in the chat from Thomas about um, the transferability. 
um, which we haven't necessarily seen with, with this PLC yet, but on our very first one, which was about small teaching online, the group voluntarily decided, you know what, we want to come back at the end of semester and see how some of these small changes have been impactful in our classroom. So we read that one in the fall of 2020 and everyone was saying, oh, there's a spark here. There's a spark there. I want to try this. I want to try that. And we thought, okay, go away and try those things. Um, great. Uh, and then the group wanted to come back together in April to be able to discuss, okay, so what happened? And just going off of the comment of like, we wanted to, there was a big call to action in the first, even just our first meeting. Um, for those of you who may not um, be super familiar with Nipissing, we're a really small university. So the fact that we had 33 people um, is a sizable chunk. And there was a lot of like, um, decision makers who decided to join as well. So I think that filled folks with hope. Um, and that, yeah, I, like it, there is a critical enough mass that now that we're all thinking and having these conversations that something can come out of it. Not to say that we're any less of a bureaucracy than any university, but <laughs> just the numbers are in our favor for this one. And I see another question in the chat from Laura just about the power dynamics and, and students and their faculty in the, same, in the same group. I don't think we have any students with their faculty in the same group. We haven't specifically tracked that. I mean, we do have some PhD students with folks who I know are part of their PhD program in terms of faculty, but that's a much closer relationship than a third year undergrad. Um, and I think that, you know, recognizing that we were bringing in students and recognizing that we were bringing in staff who might be in the room with their supervisors and things mm -hmm. like that. That That is why we got to the conversation about norms um, that we hadn't really engaged with in the other PLCs. Heather, is that a, a long enough awkward pause? <laughs> Part of our facilitation is that I think thinking time and good awkward pauses are good. So we're, we're enacting that now. Um, and yay, we have a participant who's saying um, it is a very positive space to exchange ideas. Yes. Um, we have seen a lot of folks who attended the first time show up to the second meeting and so on and so forth. Um, not, I mean, that's totally anecdotal that we can say that it's a safe and a brave space, but um, as a facilitator, I can say that the norms have definitely been respected, especially those ones around confidentiality. And see, we have some fans of awkward pauses. <laughs> Thinking time. All right. I think that's a nice long awkward pause. And I'm not seeing other questions. Oh, here's another question, just in time. Um, so the question about what are your thoughts regarding high flex learning or high, hybrid learning um, being implicated, being implemented more in institutions? I'll take this one, Heather. <laughs> I have thoughts, but you go right ahead. I think, I think there, there are times and places for it. I don't think it's the one-stop shop, the one perfect silver bullet that's going to solve everything. Um, there are times and places for hybrid learning and high flex learning. I do think it needs to be well supported. It can't just be like, haha, we're just throwing this at you. Um, here at Nipissing, we've we've tried to do it as best we can. I mean, recognizing that we're not we're not a gigantic university with a gigantic endowment. We can't just throw money at it. So, so how can we do it appropriately? What can we, what can we expect from our faculty? What um, frugal means can we build into the infrastructure? So we've converted 20 classrooms um, to be able to do lecture capture and, and things like that. And then we've tried to build in um, training systems for faculty, both in advance, but also a lot of training and a lot of supports uh, around, um, you know, drop in assistance, right? How can we come and try and solve the problem that you're having right now? Heather, any more on your side? Oh, you nailed it. I think if you're going to teach, you have to have the supports in place. And um, our institution does a great job in online and face-to-face -face learning and has done for many years. So I think 
in a transition, as long as it's supported, it can go really well. And, and yeah, then I think, we have uh, some... Danae, go you've got a, a comment here too, where, you know, there are equity pieces here. There are equity pieces where the online um, is a good support or a better support for, for those students who, for whatever reason, um, need to choose to attend from home, right? Now, now, obviously here and now we're talking about the like, what if they get sick from COVID and need to flip and things like that, or, 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 or need to support someone that's homesick with, uh, with COVID. But I think just building in the flexibility for now and forever and, and thinking about equity and thinking about inclusion um, are all critical pieces. Yeah, and this is um, definitely timely. Um, COVID has absolutely shone a light on some of the systemic barriers in teaching and learning, and some of them are within our locus of control and some of them aren't. But I think there's a heightened consciousness um, amongst instructors, professors, faculty, staff, et cetera, um, to understand that we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. And I think that's a good lesson to take in the post COVID world, not that I believe that we're there yet, but um, I hope that I can still stay front of mind when things go back to the new normal. And you're right, uh, Laura, it is an important conversation, especially, especially in the North. And that's where some of the locus of control pieces come into play, right? Ridiculously poor in, you know, internet infrastructure doesn't, doesn't help this, right? Designing programs that require huge bandwidth and 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 wi-fi access all wi-fi access all the time um are not going to serve learners in the north uh, at least not yet but hopefully our locus of control is to push the various levels of government to to up their game on that infrastructure and just before we wrap up i wanted to thank everyone for coming i know it's like friday evening and the weekend is <laughs> just a few moments away so thank you for taking time out of your days um and yeah you can find us i know tess just or ecampus ontario just retweeted about us on twitter so if you ever want to chat with either of us we are totally game and we can support you in getting a plc like this started at your own institution because we've seen so many positive returns so thanks everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday and uh, enjoy the, the last little bit of tests remaining. Thanks all.